This video explains the changes I've had to make to my Raspberry Pi Pico tank game so that it will work with the latest version of the Pimeroni MicroPython libraries for the Raspberry Pi Pico display pack. So well, let's explain the changes I needed to make because of the new library. This is going to talk about potential pitfalls of doing something that doesn't follow the API. As my earlier code read data direct from the display memory and that is no longer possible. It's also going to provide an introduction to programming the Pimeroni Pico display library for anyone that is looking at creating their own code to run on the Pico display. First, an introduction to the game and how it was developed. The game was originally created for Pi Game Zero to demonstrate how vector graphics can be used in game programming. This was used in my book, Beginning Game Programming with Pi Game Zero. It is a pass and play 2D artillery game with the aim to try and hit your opponent's tank. I developed the game further after publishing the book. The main thing was to update it to use object-oriented programming. The current version therefore uses different classes for the tanks, the ground and the shell sprites. I then bought a Pimeroni display pack for the Raspberry Pi Pico. I thought it would be a good exercise to create a port of the tank game. As it's a vector-based game, I thought it should be less demanding than trying to create more complex graphics from image files. But since then, the display library provided for the display pack has been completely redesigned. I have made some changes so that the game will now run on the new display library, but it involves some quite significant changes partly due to a decision about how I coded the game in the very first version. I'm showing the Pi Game Zero version of the game here, as its larger size makes it easier to see. The game uses a rugged landscape, which is randomly generated. For the Pi Game Zero, this was created as a polygon, but for the Pico version, it instead used vertical lines, which create the landscape. I'll explain that in more detail later. There are then two tanks facing each other. These are positioned randomly. Originally, these were created using different shapes, but for the Pico version, it had to be simplified slightly and now uses a combination of rectangles, lines, and individual pixel updates to create the shape of a tank. The player adjusts the trajectory of the gun, sets the power, and then fires a shell. The shell being a small rectangle, which flies through the air following a trajectory curve. If the shell hits the ground or goes off the screen, then the play passes to the other person. Or if the shell hits the opponent's tank, then the current player wins. It's the way that the game detects a hit that is the main thing that needs to be changed. In the earlier version, I was able to read the colour of a specific pixel to see if the colour matched one of the tanks or the colour of the ground. As you can see here, the colour adjacent to the shell position is normally the same as the sky colour until it actually hits something. This is easy to check using Pi Game Zero, but the method I used on the Pico display no longer works. I had to look at using a different technique to detect the shell hitting an object instead. This can be a challenge whenever porting an application between platforms. Even though I've used Python code for both these, due to the differences in the way that the display drivers are implemented, there needed to be significant changes. And this all comes down to the different APIs available on the different platforms. First, what is an API and what difference does that make to the program in question? API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's a way that programs can communicate by stating how requests are sent and how data is shared. Whilst the name suggests it's used for applications to communicate, in this case I'm referring to the use of display software libraries. You can think of an API as a set of rules to be followed. In this case, the method you need to call and the arguments required to display an image on the Pico display. The idea of an API is that you're told how to use it and as much as possible the way of communication should always work. Where possible it should maintain backwards compatibility. That is, even if the library is updated, software written for it before the update should still work. But that's not always possible. Let's look at an example using a fictitious smart fan used to control cooling in a room. This is a contrived example and it's oversimplified, but it should illustrate the point. In fan version 1.0, we have a basic cooling fan, which is either on or off. This is controlled by a temperature management system and or a smartphone app. In this version, the fan can only be turned on and off, so it has a very simple API, allowing simple instruction. Turn on 
or turn off. The temperature management system can control the fan automatically when a certain threshold is reached and a smartphone app can be used when a user wants to override the automated controls. If the API is public, it's also possible to integrate these with other systems. Now imagine there's a version 2, known as Smart Fan Plus. This fan adds different speed settings. The company wants to maintain backwards compatibility, but also wants devices to use the API to be able to set different speeds. In this case, it can extend the functionality by adding additional commands, but maintaining backwards compatibility with the old API. So as well as having the turn on and turn off, there's additional command set speed X, where X is the speed that you desire. The turn on command won't be able to change the speed, but it can be used with a sensible option, either to set a default speed or by setting it back to the last speed it was before it was turned off. In this way, the phone and temperature control system can still continue to turn the device on and off. Perhaps there's then a software update for the phone, meaning you could control the fan speed. But the controller does not have an update, but it can still work with its original functionality. And imagine now that version 3 of the hardware is a more complex system, which uses a desired temperature instead, and manages the amount of cooling itself, all within the fan. The manufacturer decides that it no longer makes sense to be able to just turn it on and off, or just set the fan speed. So they create a new API. The new device no longer understands the turn on, turn off and set speed requests. Instead, the new API only accepts set temperature. This is known as breaking backwards compatibility, as those using the old API will no longer be able to communicate with the fan. In the case of the smartphone, then it may be possible to create a new app and that new version of the app would understand the new API. But the temperature management system is no longer compatible and cannot be used without either replacing it, or perhaps a firmware upgrade. Comparing this with the display pack, the change here wasn't so much in terms of the physical hardware, but in additional functionality. I also believe there was an attempt to simplify the way this is used, in terms of combining different display drivers into a single interface, and hiding some of the complexity from the user. I'll come back to the implications of this last reason later. The additional functionality is the ability to use different colour depth for the images to display. This is useful for the Pico because of the limited amount of memory that it supports. So they have removed the old display library, at least the MicroPython version of that library, and instead created a new Pico graphics module, which is a unified graphics and display library. It's a shame they didn't keep the old library as well, as that would have meant the code could still use the old method, but I guess doing so discourages people from using the old library and that means they can focus on developing the new one and that people will start to use that one more. The result of this is that any software written using the old code will no longer work. And this includes my tank game demonstration program. I've now updated my tank game to support the new library and I'll show this now. I'm just going to show the new methods here rather than how the rest of it works. The first thing is to import the new library, in my case the Pico display. So I used from Pico graphics import Pico graphics and then display Pico display. Then to create the display instance I use this line which creates an object known as display. This is simpler than the steps that were needed previously. You can then say set the backlight using display.setBacklight. To change the colours, you create a pen for each of the colours that you use. So in this example, we're using display create pen and using the RGB red, green, blue values. When you clear the screen, it will flood the screen with the colour of the pen that's currently set. So here this sets the screen guide to be blue. You can then set a different colour pen and draw different objects, say using a rectangle, using display.rectangle, or a row of pixels using display pixel span, or one of the other methods in the library. I also changed the button detection to use the Pimeroni button library, so I've imported 
button from Pimeroni and then used these values which are the buttons on the Pico display. If you're using the standard API then those are the main things you need to change but in my case I'd not completely followed the API and as a result my program still didn't work. The way I detect whether the shell hits is something I decided when I created the Pi Game Zero version of the game. Rather than trying to work out all the points where the shell could collide, I used the technique whereby I set the tanks to a unique colour. In Pi Game Zero, I could use a feature of the screen object to find out the colour of an individual pixel. Unfortunately, this was not available on the Pico. I therefore found another way of reading the colour of each pixel, which was done by using the buffer used for the display. The memory buffer was created as part of the initialization of the display library. You created a buffer which the display library would make changes to and then you call the update method to push the updates from the buffer to the actual display. The actual details of the buffer were not documented but through a bit of reverse engineering I was able to work out how the colours were saved and read the appropriate memory to determine the pixel colour on the screen. Whilst the new library still uses a memory buffer that's now hidden within the initialization of the Pico graphics library. It's not something that can be easily accessed. My workaround of reading directly from the buffer is no longer available. This is what I meant by not following the API. Even though the API changed anyway, all the other features needed are included in the new version. I just needed to update to reflect that changes to the API. This isn't the case for the access to the display buffer. It was never a feature of the API and therefore, as far as the writer of the library was concerned, should not have caused any problems for users. And this is the risk of not following the API. Whenever possible, I recommend sticking to the API, but there are sometimes undocumented features you could find through looking at the library source code. Reading the data directly as I did here is something I may consider if I want to get around a limitation and can't think of another simpler way of doing it. And this is more common when programming microcontrollers using the C languages. Python often hides this kind of low level access from the programmer. Just be aware of the risk of this. If you ever do try and work around the API, and remember it could mean that your code stops working in the future if the library changes. So how did I get around this problem? Well, I changed the way that I performed the collision detection. In the case of the tanks, I created a bounding box which makes collision detection easy by checking to see if the shell is in effectively this rectangle. It's not as accurate as it would not detect a hit on the gun and there are some positions where the detection is not completely accurate but it's close enough particularly on this small display. For the ground fortunately the way I implemented it using vertical lines meant that I could add a method to the land class to easily detect if a shell had gone below the pixel used to draw the land. Here's a demonstration showing how the ground position is generated. The code generates a random landscape from left to right, starting at a random y position, then increasing or decreasing the y position, a random amount across the x-axis. This is stored in a list of positions in the land class, a list called land y positions. And this means that it's easy to determine if an XY position is below the ground by checking it against that list, which is what the code does here. With that complete, it's now possible to get the game working with the new libraries and following the API this time. And my workaround that I used before has now been removed. My updated code is available to download from GitHub. See the link in the description. The game is really just a demonstration of what could be achieved on the Pico display and this video has really been about understanding what the API is and the risk of trying to do something outside the API. I hope you found this useful. If you do, please give it a like. Be interested in what you think about this kind of video. Do you prefer my project demonstrations or would you prefer a more in-depth code walkthrough? Or do you like this type of video? where I include information about the decisions I made and the computer science concepts involved. I like to include a variety in my videos, but if there's something you do particularly like, then it'd be useful to know. Thanks for watching. Please click subscribe if you're not already a subscriber.
I look forward to seeing you on a future video.